for today's devotional, we're going to be talking about uh, the burdens of God versus the burdens of man. And the uh, first scripture reference I have for us is Matthew 6. Uh, a couple of scriptures in here, but starting in verses 25 to 27. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your, your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? And then further in verses 31 through 34, Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Another section I have here in Matthew 11 that relates, Matthew 11 verses 28 uh, through 30. Let me read this. Uh, yes. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I, lately, or I, I guess really in general, it, this is a lesson of these beautiful instructions that I have to learn over and over again, it seems. Um, you know, just right now with the cold weather, I, there's a lot, of, a lot of trouble and tribulation that, that uh, with the first hard freeze. Uh, you know, I know plenty of people whose cars won't start right now. We had two of the cars popped an engine light in the last week. Our heating system on the house is a little bit on the fritz. And man, uh, a lot of times I find myself pacing the floor, worrying about the contingencies. You know, what's the worst case scenario that's going to happen? And what do I have to do to plan for this? And the reality is that uh, I really won't know the answer to those until we call the technician. They, t they check it out find out what the problem is, find out what the solution is, and then we make the call on it. And all I've done through that time when I didn't listen to the word, wear a little extra down on the floor where I was pacing and worrying and add a little extra stress to my life that didn't do anything. It didn't add a, sing a cubit to my stature or a day to my life or an hour, a minute, or a second. It really just took a lot of that away. And uh, elsewhere, we also have in John 16, 33, the fact that, you know, everything isn't roses all the time. We do have trouble. We have tribulation in this life. And in this, this passage, oh, I'm in Matthew. Let me turn to John 16, 33. We're told that we're going to have trouble. And in here, these things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. That's the beauty story here, that Christ has already obtained the victory for us. And I kind of look at this also as like a coach, a good coach, would tell you when you're playing sports, don't worry about the fourth quarter. Focus on the play right now. Play at hand. And that's what it's founded in Scripture right there. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about later. Now, most of our sports coaches can't assure the victory. But in this life, we have that assurance through Christ. We have, he has attained the victory. We're playing for the fun of it. So we don't have to worry about the fourth quarter. We know, we've read the end. We know who wins. Now it's follow and faithful steadfastness on a day-to-day -day in the walk that he has called us to. And that's really hard to do sometimes. Um, a, a couple of stories here, uh, and I'll try to keep it short, but one of my favorite songs, hymns, is It Is Well With My Soul. Now the words alone are incredible. 
But when you pair it with the story of how it was authored, of, of the trials and tribulations that the guy who wrote that song was, and what he was going through at the time, it just becomes that much more powerful. Horatio Spafford, Horatio Spafford uh, was a, a lawyer and investor in, in the 1870s. In 1871, in the Great Chicago Fire, he lost all of his investments. Basically, all of his worldly possessions were consumed in that fire. In the same year, his only son died due to sickness. Two years later, he sends his wife and four daughters on a boat over to England with the plans that he's gonna meet them over there. Uh, and during that voyage, on the way, that ship hits another ship and in 12 minutes, the ship is lost. His communication back about the situation was a very short uh, telegram from his wife that started out with, saved alone. He lost his four daughters in that. And with such great loss, such great struggle and tribulation, he set sail over to England to meet with his wife. As they are approaching the location that uh, the original ship was lost, uh, he asked the, uh, the sailors there to let him know when they approach that, that location. And he looks out over the water and he pins the song, It Is Well With My Soul. So I'm gonna read the, the lyrics real quickly uh, here. And because I think it's powerful when you know that story of how in all of that, he can still look to his victor and say that it is well. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, so when the good and the bad, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but in whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh, my soul. And Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight, and the clouds be rolled back as a scroll, the trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. The sight and the focus that he had, not on the moment, but to the future, to the glorious future that we have in Christ, allowed him in truth and in honesty within his soul to say that it is well as he looked across that horizon and focused up to Christ. So the other incredible story that I, I latch on to um, in situations like this too are, are with Job. I mean, Horatio Spafford losing everything. Job also in the Old Testament, you know, incredible story there. And um, in the first three chapters, we see in chapter one that Job says, an incredible statement. The Lord gave and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Man, can we say that every time? That, how awesome it is when that's our focus. Because every gift, everything that we have is from him. And Job nailed it with that. But then two chapters later, you kind of see him almost teeter a little bit in his faith. And this shows the humanness. Uh, where in Job 3.3, he talks about, may the day of my birth perish. And how he, in essence, almost regrets the fact that he was born because of the great anguish he's, he's in. And I'll take a quote that kind of sums up this from a, um, a Bible scholar that I follow called Chad Bird, or by the name of Chad Bird there. Uh, he made the statement, amens, anger, and anguish swirl inside the faithful. God will accept them all. He meets us where we're at. He wants us to lay our burdens, our struggles on him and maintain faith in him.